A very good morning. I'm David Batsoffen and I host a travel blog called Travel and Things. And I'm in conversation with Hilton Walker this morning. He's from Great Plains Conservation. Hilton, don't look behind you, but there is a cheetah about to pounce on your head. <laughs> How are you doing? Hi, David. How are you doing? Very well, just, thank you. Yeah. Just, just a little chilly this morning. I mean, normally I'm just in a shirt so that I can show off the branding, but it's too cold this morning. <laughs> You know, somebody left the front door open somewhere along the line because we, we're down in White River and um, even my phone was screaming at me telling me this morning that it was minus one and uh, we don't usually get to that temperature down here so our, our dog refuses to leave his bed. You know, he's uh, well ensconced, he's not even going out today. <laughs> if it wasn't for the fact that I had to go out this morning or chat to you, I'd probably still be in bed as well. It's the best place to be at the moment. Well, that, that may be scary, yeah. Yes. Tell us a little bit about Great Plains uh, Conservation, who they are, what they're doing, and more importantly, what are they doing at the moment? Okay. Um, Great Plains has been around for 12, 13 years. It's a conservation tourism company started way back by Derek and Beverly Joubert, um, National Geographic Explorers, uh, well-known film uh, makers. Beverly, obviously, also a well-known National Geographic fine art photographer. Um, and along with a, with, a, with a host of other friends. And um, essentially they were at that stage looking at the tourism industry and, and they felt that there wasn't really any company that was focused on conservation and conservation um, entities or projects primarily. But there are a lot of companies inside the tourism industry that obviously profess to have conservation programs or may dabble in conservation initiatives, but it almost seems to be a secondary. And um, Great Plains decided that they wanted to focus predominantly on making sure that we had sustainable conservation programs at the core of what we do, bring in communities into the business, and then use um, a very soft and light uh, footprint of tourism, um, resulting in a higher revenue type of business model in order to fund those programs. Um, we've been remarkably well. We started off originally in, in uh, Botswana and Kenya. Uh, grown the portfolios over the years in those two countries and then over the last couple of years have started working in Zimbabwe and uh, that's been an exciting ride working in Zimbabwe for, for a whole bunch for a whole rest of reasons but you know Great Plains is, is not one to shy away from the bigger and the hairy scary goals and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit later about our Rhinos with our Borders program that we did with and beyond but we like to, to unpack those bigger schemes. We like to unpack the bigger projects and then really try and work on and, and try and solve those. Um, purely for us, it's the right thing to do. And uh, very often internally, we like to classify ourselves almost like a bit of a pirate company. Um, we're a motley bunch of, of, of passionate people that are involved in the tourism industry with conservation. Again, it's, it's at, uh, at our core. But um, we like to move quickly. We, we like to you know, make, have hard and fast conversations and then you know, getting stuck in. We don't like to have things being kicked around for, for months on end. Um, what we usually find is when that happens, we, we kind of lose the drive to even do that if, if it becomes just too long-winded. So yeah, it's a great company. Um, in terms of, of guests, we have pre-COVID, because obviously we're now yeah. suffering from, from that. But pre-COVID, we were looking at about 19,500 bed nights that we're doing as a group. Um, we, it's, it's, it's quite humbling for us when, when we talk to people outside of Great Plains and you know, they, they, they marvel at sometimes what we do. Um, we don't seem to, to recognize that internally. We're quite humbled by that. We view ourselves as a very small type, niche type of business. Um, but we know that we make an impact and inroads in a lot of things that we do. And this is obviously why we exist. Uh, when you said uh, you were viewed as pirates, is that every time because every time you see an exciting animal or it's a interesting you know sighting you just go ah there be the animals <laughs> <laughs> yeah why do why do pirates look like that just because they are because but, they are. Um, yeah we have a very flat structure in terms of the company to be honest um obviously we've got Derek and beverly who are the ceos um Myself at the upper management level, on the expert level, um, along with my colleagues, and then you know into reservations and into the various silos of the business. But we're not a silo-driven business. You know, we um, we have this philosophy within the company that we almost work on projects and on a day-to-day, -day, almost like a pack of um, 
you know, wild dogs. And, right. And whereas who's ever the best champion to lead the, the pack will take lead on that. So it could be that at times I'm actually reporting and pulling in and sitting behind, you know, somebody that traditionally in, you know, a, a more traditional hierarchical type of business wouldn't be the one leading a program. But, I, you know, it's, it's a very fluid business structure that we have and also a very flat business structure. There's a lot of conversation that happens throughout the day across multiple disciplines. And I think this is why sometimes it's very difficult to try and peg us into a specific role because we <laughs> step in and out of these roles all the time. So it's a little bit disconcerting when you're talking to the Harvard Business School. They don't quite get it. You, you're all a bunch of disruptors, as I think the new word, uh, the new term is. But... Um, I just I, jokingly I want to say about Be uh, Derek and Beverly, they're responsible for I think a lot of people coming to Africa and going, we want to see a kill, and you go why? No, we've seen Derek and Beverly's uh, documentaries, and in 48 minutes there've been five kills. We want to see these now, and then you explain to them very nicely that those documentaries can take somewhere between five and eight years possibly to put together to cut those 48 minutes out of thousands of hours so it's not yeah. just you know drive out into the bush and something dies in front of your lens you know that's very interesting you do find that initially that is the the, the correspondence or the, the the question that does get raised by our guests however what i also have found over the years of working with great planes is that there's a deeper dialogue that happens within the Derek and beverly japan movies um and, you know, there's a, there's a message and there's a reason why they're creating it. They're not just going out to, you know, take wonderful imagery of wildlife. You know, there's a, there's a reason of what, they, there's a story of what they're trying to tell yeah. you. And the cool thing about our camps, because they're not large and, and impersonal, they're very often anything between eight to maybe even 12 guests at a time. That's those stimulating conversations that happen around, um, you know, a dining room table or happen, you know, around that open fireplace, you know, after the nights. Um, you know, dinners and the day's activities that really stimulates the conversation that we're enjoying. Um, and it's another tenet of why we exist. You know, we want to be able to have these stimulating intellectual conversations about the world at large and also about what's happening up in Botswana or what's happening up in Kenya. Um, and certainly the level and the, the caliber of the guest that travels with us is looking for that stimulating conversation. Um, it's certainly not, you know, a lecture. It's certainly not um, over the top. It's certainly not overpowering. You know, we are guided by the amount of information and amount of dialogue that the guest is wanting to drive. But being exposed to that, um, that messaging beforehand, before they come to our camps and see where that footage is actually being filmed, it brings a new element into the safari for the guests. And I think this is what makes it more tangible, more real. Um, and, and they get a deeper appreciation and involvement in it. You know, it's very rarely that we just have a guest that comes in, does a morning drive, afternoon drive over a couple of nights and then leaves. You know, the correspondence continues way after they've actually stayed with us. And um, that's really, really nice to, to have these conversations and these dialogues with guests, you know, long after they've stayed with us. Have you got people in your camps currently? Because I'm, I'm assuming that um, Botswana is going through similar lockdown to us, as is uh, Kenya and, and possibly even Zimbabwe. Yeah, so we still have staff. Um, we haven't laid off any staff. In, in our groups. Um, we've obviously had to take measures and, and be clever with the way that we expand in our uh, financial horizon. Um, having said that, the, the future is looking pretty good for us, you know, all things considered. Um, 2021, we've had some great support from our trade partners as well as guests that were staying with us this year that have postponed um, relatively few cancellations, which I think, you know, is a, is a wonderful testament to that. Um, but certainly in the camps, we've got managers that are on duty, we've got chefs that are there, we've got staff. Some of the staff obviously have returned back home and um, they don't need to be staying at the camp specifically. Um, but also critically and crucially, what we've also done is we've taken our guides that would have been hosting our guests on, on morning and afternoon drives and walks. Um, and we put them into the anti-poaching uh, patrol. And so we've actually pulled them into the APU units and, and, and allowed them and ensured that we're still having a drive in around on the properties. And this is key critical, not just for Great Plains, but Africa at large, that as tourism has dried up and as the arrival and the movement of people on these areas has, has slowed down, so we've, what, what we've actually found is that poachers have stepped into that vacuum and almost been able to operate carte blanche on being able to, to increase the rates of poaching, which is obviously a huge concern for us. Um, the other thing that's obviously happened is also that organizations, as they become more and more financially distressed, are laying off 
these ranges and these anti poaching units. And so what we did almost as soon as COVID-19 um, you know, broke is that we started an initiative with our foundation called the Great Plains uh, Project Ranger. And what Project Ranger is, is an emergency relief fund, um, not specific only to Great Plains properties, but what goes out and raises money in order to support the APUs and the Grangers and the wildlife guides throughout Africa that are still looking after areas where wildlife needs to be conserved. So we certainly understood that you know, businesses weren't able to generate revenue because of the, the, the guests not being able to travel and moving on to next year. But we also understood that if we weren't employing and we weren't supporting these anti-poaching um, you know, uh, units and these brave men and women that are literally at the front line of conservation right now, um, that we could one day wake up and not actually have any meaningful wildlife around. And uh, that could obviously have dire consequences, not just for tourism, but for conservation and, and, and the world at large. Do you want to segue from that into your Rhino project? Sure. Um, Rhino, it's, it's, it's been a very passionate project for me. Um, it's very close to my heart. It started a number of years ago where I got a telephone call. Funnily enough, I was at a trade show in Morocco. And um, usually when I'm traveling overseas, it's very rarely that Derek will phone me, email message or, or send an email. But I got a telephone call, funnily enough, during the lunch break of one of the days. And the message went basically, where are you? Um, and I, the reply was, I'm at Morocco, I'm at a trade show, you're fine. Um, we, 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 you need to have a different conversation during this trade show, which is interesting. And you know, the, the, the question was why? And it was basically at that stage in November that we moved from being a positive birth rate for rhinos in, in Southern Africa, we moved into a negative birth rate. And the poaching levels at that stage had obviously exceeded what the natural rhino populations were able to sustain on. And that was the, the birthplace of project um, for, for looking after rhinos. And initially we called it zeros for rhinos. And when we started unpacking the numbers, the, the numbers indicated that it was going to be an, over an $80 million project in order to save these rhinos. And again, being a pirate company, we were, you know, Derek wasn't just wanting to save one or two or 10. Um, <laughs> you know, when I asked him how many are we actually going to save, he was 100. And I went, All okay, of them. Okay. The whole loop. You know, if we're going to save them, we may as well save them. Let's not yeah. mess around. Go large and that's or very go typical out. of yeah, exactly. And that's <laughs> great plans. You know, that's a bit of a tomato sauce. So when we unpack the numbers, you know, I, I, I saw flippantly at that stage. Said, look, I just want to make sure that I, we'll strive for a hundred, but you know, if I only save ten, that my job's not on the line because yeah. I don't know enough people that can afford eighty thousand dollars a pop. And it's like, listen, don't worry about that. This is important to save the rhinos. We all work on it. And funny enough, six weeks later, or well, thereabouts. We actually already started having conversations with and beyond. And we found that they were also doing rhino projects and they've obviously got projects and, and property down here in South Africa. Um, and so that's where Rhinos Without Borders came about, is that we actually joined forces between Great Plains and and beyond. The first time that we think collectively, or at, at any stage, two competing commercial companies have come together in order to save a, a wildlife species from extinction. And that's what we were really looking at at that stage. Um, through the collaboration and through you know working a little bit smarter, we were able to bring that project total down to $45 million. So we all breathed a little bit easier because there was some savings there. Um, but I must tell you that within about three, three and a half years, and with the fantastic support that we had from direct guests from around the world, working with our foundation, but also with the travel trade at large, because there was vested interest for travel trade to obviously ensure that Brian has been one of the more iconic species, and you'll note I don't talk about Big Five, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. But the iconic species, we actually managed to move um, a sizable number of rhinos from South Africa to, to safe areas in Botswana. Um, the end total ended up funding up at 88, but we actually moved out of the 100. Um, Botswana then went into a drought process last year, so we said, okay, well, it wouldn't be you know, um, fair or even feasible for us to move rhinos into that, into that area, and then obviously COVID arrived. But remarkably, and we're still scratching our head about this, is that the, the cows that we've moved, the, the female rhinos that we've moved across, have been unbelievably productive. So you've actually had over 100 rhinos walking around in, in Botswana in the areas which we look after with new babies um, being born. And we've actually got an initiative now where we can actually get guests name a rhino, you know, rain, okay. name a baby rhino calf. Um, and that's, that's been fantastic to see how people actually just resonating behind that. You know, the chance that they ever see that rhino in the wild is, is, is slim um, because obviously we don't, you know, uh, these, are, these are really truly remote areas within Botswana that we, that we relocate these rhinos to. Um, 
but the, there's an affinity between humans and wanting to save this rhino. And it's been wonderful to see how the, you know, the response from guests. So certainly it's a project that continues. We're not going to be walking away from it. Um, we also work very closely with the various departments within Botswana. Um, the department, Botswana government have been very supportive with regards to that. Um, and then funny enough, the, the, the unintended consequence onto this, which is really quite cool, and it's almost, you know, it would seem, it's seem clear now if you think about working in the natural world that everything is interconnected. Um, that wilderness safaris have also obviously been working on saving rhinos for many years, in fact, longer than what we were involved in rhinos. Um, and purely through collaboration, we found that rhinos without borders and their initiatives have also started to you know, work closer and closer together in terms of looking after the species. So it's wonderful to see that commercially we may enjoy a bit of an arm you know wrestle and mm. you know convince the guests to come stay at our camps but from a com from a conservation and from a foundation and from a, um, a, a sustainability point of view you actually find that there's this almost gravitation of, of companies coming towards each other which goes very well for us in, in terms of that and it's certainly something that we're looking at, at, at trying to understand probably you know encapsulate in some form and being able to share worldwide as a best practice for, for other conservation entities around the world. Um, conservation is certainly very expensive. It's hard to raise money. Um, you know, it's like any donor or any fundraiser will, will, will tell you, for every 100 telephone calls that you have, you know, 88 of them will be put down in your ear. Five of them have been told, yes, I'll call you back, and actually three actually really materialize. So there are times when it can be hugely sapping in terms of your, your own energy. But when you do pull it off and when you are standing on the side of a runway and you've seen this, heli this, this helicopter come and pick up a rhino and what we do is we now slingshot them to the release areas, it's probably one of the moments when we will stop crying. And it's, 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 it's one of the best feelings in the world to know that you've been directly instrumental in being able to save a species from extinction. Hilton, don't you find often that your guides are asked the question, if rhinos are under so much pressure, how come they're often the very, one of the first animals that are spotted, specifically white rhino, that are spotted during a game drive? Um, I've been on dozens of vehicles and this question comes up a lot. And then you've got to sort of go, yes, but, you know, for every one you see, there are probably two carcasses that you don't see. Look, that certainly, that certainly could be the case. Um, I think what we have done in South, South Africa and other areas is that over the last couple of years, we've certainly got to understand a lot more about how to look after rhinos. Um, I think rhinos have had to sacrifice something in terms of their natural movements by being almost, without you know, lack of a better word, corralled or, mm. or kept in these high intensity security areas. Certainly, if you're looking at like the Kruger and the fantastic work that they've been doing there. But then I think very often as humans, we forget that we actually are part of a human, of a natural world. And so we kind of disconnect ourselves all the time from this natural world. And COVID certainly is busy giving us a huge hiding to each of us that we actually are more important, you know, part of this natural world than what we seem to believe. Um, and so there's almost, I like to believe, certainly from my side, I don't think there's any scientific proof behind this. And this is to answer your question, that rhinos feel safer by knowing that they're around people that are protecting them. And it's almost like on a subconscious level, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's the same as why do we feel so relaxed when you're sitting next to an elephant when just gently watching those ears flap and the deep rumble that comes out of an elephant. You know, it goes straight through your soul and immediately you get goose flesh. You know, no matter where you've been in the world, I don't mind, I don't care whether you come from Moscow or the, the most concrete built up areas in the world. When you're in that natural world environment, you're sitting there and you're at peace and you hear that sound or a roar of a, of a lion, there's something inside your body that goes, whoa, pay attention, yeah. you know, this thing could eat me. Um, so I think that's, that's, you know, from a, certainly from the rhino's perspective, I think there is this affinity that they realize that this is a safe environment. Um, they kind of know that they're not being put under pressure. They get to realize that the signs and the sounds, um, that they can, you know, they can, they can be at peace and they're not going to be put under pressure. I think any natural being in the world, you know, would, would resonate the same way. Mm. Same as, you know, your, your common house dog, you know, the difference between beating it and looking after it with love. If you look after it with love, it'll, it'll be your best mate forever. And uh, I think that happens in the natural world as well. You mentioned that your camps have a very light footprint. Does yes. this mean that you have to give up some luxury uh, like Wi-Fi and electricity and proper running water? Or have you be been able to, within your conservation um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the, the way you want to portray conservation, you're able to include all of that, yet it's not huge poles and, and you know, tanks that are visible and that type of thing. David, it was very critical for us because we wanted to focus on as few guests on a piece of land as possible to make sure that we could derive the revenues. There's a balancing scale between revenue generation and conservation. Um, the purest form of conservation is to take over a million hectares, secure it in, in some form without a fence, um, and then not have one single person drive up and down or even touch that land. But who's going to pay for that? It's impossible. What's the point? So you want to, well, the point is you say the whole bunch of land in Africa, which is cool, but you can't, you know, financially you can't afford yeah. that unless you're just a billionaire, which there's not many of us or those around. So there is a balancing act between saying, okay, what do we want to do? And the average size of our concessions range from anything from 50,000 hectares up to 120, 140,000 hectares. Um, so certainly large tracts of land that we're taking. And so when we look at the light footprint, we look at the number of guests, it obviously gives us an indication of price point, and then we have a look at how we accommodate that guest. Um, in all of our camps, except one, which we acquired, it was already constructed. Literally, some of these camps are built on a teaspoon of concrete. So the idea is, is that should we need to, we could remove those camps out of the area within two months. There should be minimal scarring that's left out in the area. Um, we were the first company in Botswana, if not Africa, that removed all plastic mineral water bottles out of our camps. So you can imagine at that stage, we were charging $1,200 per person per night. Um, and we said to the market, well, we're not going to give you plastic mineral water bottles anymore. And um, obviously the trade came to us and said, well, Mr. Schwartz is going to have a heart attack. How could you not give mineral water? We said, we still give you filtered water. We just don't want to give it to plastic because plastic takes a thousand years to degrade. And there's actually yeah. studies that are coming out with plastic breaking down in sunlight and heat that actually cleanse up on the memory glands of humans. So there is that study starting to come out of Scandinavia. So buying your, your, your water from the store is probably not a good idea if you understand the life cycle of water. Um, we then went through and we've had a look at things like bioreactors where we use all of the waste from our kitchens to create our own gas so that then goes back into our kitchens to fire up the burners to cook the food on. Um, we've also uh, moved our generators offline in the sense that we would, Zarafa, for example, when it first opened, within two years of its opening, won the World Responsible Tourism Award for the most environmentally friendly camp in the world in a two years. And it purely because what we did is we took the generator that was pumping out three and a half tons of carbon dioxide an hour. We took that offline, cut off a nice chunk of the cable, and put up 179 solar panels and overcapitalized on a huge thing. But it was the first camp that had ever been done. Now, obviously, we know a lot better now about camps running on solar panels. Um, we are looking at technology in terms of our game drive vehicles. Um, we're looking at in terms of electric vehicles. What does that mean? Um, certainly softening the footprint the whole time. Um, all of our camps, for example, are built out of recycled hardwoods. So, you know, a lot of our camps like Duba Plains, the Rafa, Mara Plains, Mara Nika, which is our brand new camp in the Naboshaw. We've actually taken railway sleepers from disused railway lines and um, we brought those into the camps. Now you can just imagine our heavy one railway sleeper is found on an entire camp out of that. Um, but we, you know, we use that for outside decking. It's a great texture, very tactile. But even in terms of inside the rooms, we then cut those, turn them over, polish them, and you get that high gloss that comes through. So it's wow. beautiful reclaimed wood. Um, and then, you know, our camps be made out of canvas and that type of thing. So the entire process, we're constantly looking at refining. Um, again, being pirates, we're never really happy with what we've achieved. We constantly say, right, we've done this, let's go back and relook at it and re, you know, re-engineer it. Um, in terms of cuisine, for example, we don't cook with, with um, flour. You know, it, it's, it's quite funny. People come and say, you know, I'm gluten-free. And we go, mm, okay. And they say, can you handle that? And we go, yeah, sure. Or we don't even tell guests that it's, you know, it's very, uh, very often the food that we're cooking is gluten-free until they tell us, wow, this is the most delicious thing we've tasted. And we go, yeah, yeah it's gluten-free. And they go, what? Um, we also don't use garlic. We don't use tomatoes, funnily enough, okay. in our food. Um, so try and do a sales call to Italy, and that becomes a little bit harder. People are not worried about your pricing. They're more worried about your ingredients <laughs> in your food. I, I have but, to um, say... There's reasons for that. I, I have to say, I'm gluten intolerant intolerant. I'm, <laughs> I'm tired of these gluten-free and vegan people trying to shove their, their eating habits down your throat, and pun intended on that. But I'm not yeah. going to delve into that because everybody has their place and far be it 
from me to be judgmental. Um, yeah, so we don't even make a big deal about that. So yeah. we don't even raise that. You know, it's not I, even an issue for us. I, I do understand the flour, perhaps, but I don't understand why garlic and tomato specifically. Why not Brussels sprouts? Or, or <laughs> exactly. One of the <laughs> cabbage. Yeah, exactly. You know, artichokes or olives. Artich you know, my yeah, olives. You're, a, yeah. you're a man after my own heart. Artichokes have no place on a on a plate. I'm no, sorry. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, I think your I think your membership on your podcast has just dropped off so significantly <laughs> after that because you know people are just going. I'm not listening to these guys. No, um, we're but carnival Beverly friendly is, uh, people. <laughs> Beverly's actually, uh, in talking about meat, it's actually interesting. We're actually looking at that as well. But Beverly's a, a homeopath at heart. Um, and there is a belief that, you know, um, tomatoes, garlic can actually, you know, excite the, the circuitry system. Um, they're not really good for the human beings. They, they, they do seem to, to work adversely in humans. Um, and we're finding diet is becoming more and more of an important you know, aspect for guests traveling to us. They want healthier foods. They want, you know, this, this new trend of garden to table. Mm. Um, you know, it is something. So it's not necessarily about, you know, being vegan or you have to be gluten-free or you have to be whatever it is, you know. It's, it's more about saying, how do I know that the food that you're serving is the, the resultant of non-pesticides and non-being plastic, you know, covered? And is, is it hydroponically grown or is it organically grown? You know, and yeah. our level of guest again is looking for that, you know, because the food does taste better and it is healthier for you. Um, you know, two important things that we've done is that we've embarked on, in fact, that was last year already, where we're removing all single use plastics out of our camps. So we started with, with mineral water bottles, but then we started having a look in the back of house and saying, how much plastic are we bringing into the camps in terms of lettuce and tomatoes, if it was yeah. served, or vegetables and that. And we were working with suppliers in you know, areas like Mound and Flick Falls in Nairobi you know, for grease-proof paper that's made out of wax, um, you know, beeswax, and, and having a look at how we can bulk package and bulk pack, you know, into crates that come out on the airplanes because we don't, you can't self drive our properties. You have to fly on an airplane to get there. Um, how do we just look at working better? So there is a concentric ring of effects that when you start at the center of your business and then you start looking at the outward layers, and I'm, uh, I'm hesitant to say an onion, considering what yeah. we've just spoken about, <laughs> but of that type of analogy, that you can yeah. actually start pushing it out, the, the benefits to the environment further than your property. And very often it, it's frustrating for us when we look at other you know, tourism entities that it's almost like my, my efforts stop at my front door. Mm. You know, um, I live in White River and there's four and a half million people that live on the border of the Kruger National Park. And my heart is breaking right now because I know there's four and a half million people that are struggling because tourism is one of the biggest employers. Yeah. And what is the impact on our social being going to be about that? You know, it's not just about looking after wildlife. It's looking after these communities that, that need to be able to see that there is value to these areas being concerned. If we don't get the communities involved in that value creation or that value recognition, we're never going to solve the, the issue with regards to poaching. We're never going to solve the issue in terms of social upliftment. Um, and so that, for me, as, a, as a, just a member of the tourism industry, regardless of Great Plains, is something that, that, that worries me the whole time. And I'm constantly thinking about that and having conversations with other like-minded organizations. But just going back quickly in terms of meat, um, there, there is a bit of a drive from our side to cut out red meat or certainly restrict the number of, 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 of the amount of red meat that, that we as a tourism industry con consume. Um, if you can imagine the number of burgers or steaks that the tourism industry or venison or sausage, you know, what we like to call the burgers, um, is consumed on a daily basis through all of the countries in Africa that have tourism, you can imagine the number of cows that are involved in Cyprus. Um, and you can imagine the, the resultant destruction in the, of, of environments, and you can imagine the amount of water that's been used, and obviously how they've been fed. And so what we're actually finding is that local communities, we wanted to, we're starting to work closely together with by saying there's, there's better husbandry practices, there's better agricultural practices that one can employ. So instead of having a herd of 200 um, you know, cows in order to get you know, some form of meaningful dollar in your back pocket, shrink the herd. Get a fatter cow, you know, get a, get a more well-fed um, cow and you can command a higher price. But also working with the tourism industry to try and say we don't have to be serving meat every single day. Um, you know, the, 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 I think the general population has adopted quite nicely this meat-free Mondays. 
Mm. Um, you know, it's quite a recognized and we, we say, cool, you're not going to have meat on a Monday. Or, you know, traditionally on a Friday, everybody was used, we used to have fish. Um, you know, and, and so that's where in the tourism industry, we're also lobbying and talking to, you know, various entities. There's, a, there's a, an event that we go to every year in May called Conservation Lab. Um, and, and those are the conversations that we have in as part of the tourism industry to say, how do we minimize impact there? So it has very little to do with us being in Tarafa, but it has everything to do with us because we're in the industry. I, I think I'm going to start packing my own biltong and, and dried vors uh, together with my bird books, just in case I'm at the camp when it's no meat, whatever day you particularly choose to do that. <laughs> you, you also alluded to something earlier, um, Hilton, and something that I'm trying to push as well, which is forget about the big five. There is more to see than just those particular animals. Yes, I know it's been used as a marketing tool for almost as long as wildlife tourism has been around. But I believe it's time to move away from that. And to it's say to the guests, and I'm sure your guests are like that, from what I'm listening to you saying, that they are more than just let's see the big five and then go home. They may want to see a golden orb web, you know, watch in the early morning as their guard walks into a golden orb web spider and then does the special spider dance in order to get yeah. out of it. Um, <laughs> you know, lying, lying on the ground watching a dung beetle. Yeah. If you know that dung beetles sometimes use the stars for navigation, I mean, how fantastic is that? David, you, you 100%, and this is a personal crusade of mine, um, to move away from us educating guests that the only thing that they can see in Africa is five animals in the big five. Um, what's also very irritating to me is the big five is actually a hunting term. Yep. So here we are in the conservation industry. Here we are telling everybody about the land that we're saving. Here we are telling everybody how we work with local communities. And then we bring a hunting term back into our narrative. It doesn't make sense. Um, and I think it is a, it's, a, it's an absolute failure for us in the tourism industry to constantly refer to the, the big five. Because what it does is that guest who's overseas, um, and quite rightly may be ignorant with regards to what is actually available inside South Africa, or even Africa at large, we're telling them, come over here and only see Big Five. You know, it, it doesn't make sense. So what we've done is we started to bring into our narrative and we certainly encourage in as many people as possible, the media, um, tourism industry, tourism associations, um, to talk about Africa's most iconic species. And that covers everything from a penguin at Boulder's Beach through to the great white sharks, through to whales off, you know, Walker Bay, which is quite nice sort of a very favorite product of mine. So there's a shout out for Michael and his team at the great work they do there. Um, you know, the folks that are in the Northern Kalahari, you know, in terms of black rhinos and desert lions and desert elephants and chameleons and butterflies, you know, there is millions and millions. I mean, Africa is so rich in its natural fauna and flora. And yet what we do is we market five species. That, that doesn't make sense. You know, and what it does ultimately is it puts our guides under pressure as well. And it creates a bit of stress for the guests because they've not, let's say, for example, they come out on safari and they're not just staying with us, they're staying at a number of properties. And they happen to see four of the big five. There's this angst now because they feel that they haven't had true value of their safari because they've now missed out on that elusive leopard for some reason. And we know leopards are difficult and that's because there's a reason why they, they're difficult to find. And yet the guest goes, you know, God, you've got, it's my last drive. You've got to get me that leopard. And so they race around the bush. Very often, I think, destroying the bush in the process or certainly pushing the limit there to find a leopard to make it feel uncomfortable just so that the guest can have feel that they've got their photograph. And it's, it's not actually it. Um, this is why sometimes when we see the repeat guests or folks like yourself that have been to the bush a number of times, you'll go, you get to an elephant site and you look at it for four or five minutes and you go, okay, I'm happy with it, but let's move on. I'm actually wanting to see something else. I want to get a deeper appreciation. And what's also very, very heartening to find is that when guests move through the various areas of, of, of Africa, you know, they may have come and said, wow, that's interesting. You know, last week we were in Namibia and we were looking at a desert elephant. Now we're in the Okavango Delta and we're looking at an elephant and they start comparing what the elephants do and what makes them slightly different. When they get to that deeper appreciation, that's where the true value, that's where the luxury of safaris yeah. actually come from. It's not about your bed and the square meterage of your room and whether you have an indoor bath and an outdoor shower and a plunge pool. I mean, we've all got that. But 
it's it's that when the guest comes back and says, wow, you really changed my life. You've really yeah. touched my soul. You've really given me something deeper to think about or contemplate or make me realize that I'm actually part of something bigger. I, I, don't know, I don't know if I'm always welcome on game drive vehicles because if we find <laughs> Impala, I will ask the, the, the guide to stop and I will wax lyrical about Impala, specifically Rams in the right light. They are achingly beautiful, beautiful to photograph beautiful. and not that easy because they're not going to stand still because they're a prey species. So That's you have to, to get that particular shot and you know the type of shot I'm talking about, sort of a glint of light on the eye, the horns nicely lit, takes, mm -hmm. takes a bit of time and, and effort. And also I find now that um, zebra and giraffe have inveigled themselves into that top echelon, if you, for want of a better term, those five. They've become, you know, forget cheetah and wild dog who were always sort of um, six and seven. The giraffe, I believe, uh, have now be forced their way into that um, top echelon and people want to see them and want to spend time with them rather than watching lions sleeping under a tree. Well, David, I think what you're doing is you're touching on the fact that guests are also starting to realize, and the reason why, certainly from our side, why we've seen the giraffe are becoming so topical is people are reading about how endangered they are. So it's actually quite a travesty on us as humans that the only time we can appreciate something is when it's about to disappear. Yeah. And it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, certainly, I drive my family crazy. Um, again, living next to the Kruger National Park, we'll take a drive in and then I'll see a lilac crested roller. And I have my son he immediately chirps in the background. It's like, oh my God, there's daddy's favorite bird. You know, because <laughs> I will sit for hours looking at those iridescent colors that a lilac crested has, waiting for the moment that it actually rolls. Yeah. Um, but again, similarly, on an impala, you know, it, it, just the fine lines, you know, you just have to appreciate, no matter what religion or what your belief structure is, that just from a natural world, the absolute minute attention to detail that this creator of ours had, that pulled all of these little things together, you've got to really just give him a round of applause or give her a round of applause, you know, if it's nature, and just say, well done. You know, yeah. you really, really have spent a lot of time. You know, you can get excited about butterflies. I mean, I've got a mate of mine who's just, he's crazy about butterflies. Yeah. You know, most people don't that time you met. But that's, I think the, the real trick is that when a guest is not just fixated on the big five and understands what it means to see a wild dog and what it actually means to have that wild dog, being, not only in terms of what their role in the environment is, but the actual fact that you can see it and spend time with him, you can understand why the guides get so excited. Yeah. You know? And it's that deep appreciation that I think is critical for all of us to, to do. And that's why we've moved away from using terms like big five. It's, it's archaic. Um, and it certainly doesn't need to be around anymore. I, I tend to, on the morning drives, if I find Impala in the mornings, I always congratulate them on making it through the night because <laughs> they are the survivors. And I mean, if we as human beings were tossed into the bush at sort of five o'clock in the afternoon uh, in, in a big five it's area and, and said, the, the, the guide will say, listen, I'll come and fetch you in the morning. If you've survived the night, I'm not giving you anything, no tents, no torches, no nothing. You've just got to sit there under the tree. And if you're still there in the morning, I will give you a round of applause. And that's what I think we need to do. The, the problem with Impala, and I, I don't know why I'm harping on about them, but the problem with them is they're so numerous. So the first time you see them, the second time it's a bit less sort of, mm, it's more Impala. And then by the third sighting, you, you start ignoring them, which is, which is wrong because it's all part of what you're saying, Hilton. It's all part of the whole. And you can't exactly. cherry pick. If you come to see, then come to see. You know, start yeah. at the top, work your way through, through everything. And then when you go home, you have a, a, a proper knowledge of what Africa and African wildlife can offer you. You know, David, I've been in this industry for... I'm going to probably give my age away and my gray hair is probably giving that as an indication already, but I've been in the industry for over 25 years. Um, I've worked for a number of, of safari companies and safari is obviously my blood and being out on drives and it's one of the biggest thrills is for my son and I to actually do father and son weekends away in the bush. And we're lucky for that. But even today, and this I think is testament that there are great guides out there, 
I'll be sitting in a vehicle and very often I don't tell the guy where I'm from because I don't want him to go, oh my God, you know, this guy's from Great Plains or he's been around or whatever it is. So I'll be told something about an Impali that even today I'll go, whoa, I yeah. didn't know that. Oh, I may have forgotten that. And I think this is another thing that, you know, guests and people that travel within, whether you're South African or you're internationally, you can keep traveling to Africa. You can keep going on a game drive. You know, just because you've done it once in your life doesn't mean to say you cannot take it off this bucket list and say, okay, I've been on a, on a wild drive back. And the reason being is that you're in a natural breathing ecosystem and every single day, that story that nature has given you will be different, even yeah. with the same animals, you know? So, you know, you, like you're saying, you, you can watch in parlor and every day they'll be doing something slightly different or you'll learn slightly different or you'll pick up on a mannerism. Um, and that, again, for us is what's so important is slow the game drive down. Stop feeling that you, you're coming out of a concrete jungle. Imagine some guests coming from London or New York. They, they, they get up at the crack of dawn very often before the kids are awake, get into these, you know, these snakes that tunnel along the ground, which we like to call affectionately as underground or tubes. You know, they then walk around with 15 million other people on a pavement, get jostled and bumped out the way into a high-rise building, they sit behind, listening on a telephone, being in a totally non-natural world, get home exhausted, and then you know, look forward to the weekend where they can restore their souls. And yet they come on holiday, and what's the first thing we do? You know, the tourism industry is kind of sadistic because we make you wake up at the crack of dawn. We would give you <laughs> an affectionate piece of dried toast, and we, we rusk with a cup of coffee, and we bumble you around for two hours, and then give you another cup of coffee because you just, you know, you survived your drive. <laughs> and we feed you, and then we let you have a rest. We, you know, we, we're kind of dictatorial in that sense because we tell you when you can have a siesta and when you can't. Um, and then we run, we run you around and we give you a congratulatory sundown and drink, you know, as a sunny <laughs> setting and we, we make you a little bit more scared at night with the sounds of Africa and we give you food and then 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock we put you back to bed. The next morning at 5 o'clock we're knocking on your door again. Yeah, start um, all over again. <laughs> but that's, that I think is going to change in the post-COVID world as well and we can see that already in our bookings. You know, we can see that um, guests are staying longer in one camp. Um, they're not doing these two nuts, two nuts, two nuts, which has never made sense, you know, because as soon as you're just getting into the routine or you're starting to enjoy your vacation, you're packing your bags, you're actually living yeah. out of a suitcase by doing that. It's, it's, a, it's the silliest way to do nuts, isn't it? Um, so guests are really starting to stay longer. They may do less product. Um, but what we've also seen, funny enough, is that they're traveling with their families or they're traveling with smaller, slightly extended families. So they're traveling in groups between six and eight. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's an interesting development. We've always had this multiple generational travel that the, the trade has been referring to. You know, and it started off with granny and grandpa knowing that their children are getting to a certain age, the children are moving out of house or about to go to college, especially in the American context. And they wanted to do this family safari, a long haul destination, always wanting to go to Africa. It was that once in a lifetime type trip. That, funny enough, over the last couple of years, has moved to where it was the parents of the grandparents, uh, or the children of the grandparents, at least, who said, we're now becoming, having the financial means that we want to take our children before they leave home, and we also want to take mom and dad with us and travel. But COVID has almost resulted in, it's not about children leaving home or my parents, it's about actually wanting to be close to each other and having that time to bond. Because a lot of families have almost been forced to be separated. You know, as humans, we like to have this interaction with each other. And I think this is one of the reasons why Zoom has taken off, because I can actually see you. You know, yeah. so instead of us, I mean, I remember when you came down to White River, we had a fantastic coffee. You know, we spent two hours just chatting. That's what we do as humans. So COVID has removed that. And so people are now saying, I want to go on vacation. I want to be safe. I'm certainly going to put myself at risk. And, I think we use, and we're certainly working on ways in order to get guests back into, into Africa and a very safe means. Um, but I'm going to spend longer with my family in one area. I want to spend time that I can choose when I'm going to go out on a game drive. Or in the afternoon, if we just happen to be playing Scrabble together, or we just happen to be talking or reminiscing, that because I'm staying longer, I don't have to go on that game drive that yeah. often. Unless, of course, there's been a you know, hugely exciting sighting. But it's, it's, there's an evolution coming through in the safari, I think. Um, and that's great to see because it also allows us to, get, to spend more time with the guests and get to know them better and get to host them better. You know, and again, that's the luxury. When I understand that you like to have your Jamison's whiskey at half past six in the morning, I might not like to necessarily agree with that, but you know, if that's what fires you up, then you're more than welcome to have your Jamison's at half past six in the morning. You know, um, you know, they are letting a little bit secret out to everybody who's listening to this. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's 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 one of the positives I think that's come out of COVID is that evolution of the of the guests stay with us.
Hilton, post, um, post this, whatever the this is, if people are looking, just as I wrap up with you, and thank you for your time today, um, how, how do they get hold of Great Plains? Um, is there a website that they can go to that they can make bookings for, for next year or to be put on a mailing list that once you guys are back up and running, you can inform them so maybe between now and the end of the year, they can even come for a visit. Sure. Okay. So we've actually never been as busy as what we are right now. Um, <laughs> Derek and I are just, uh, often talk and we say, we, we are so hectic that we haven't been able to generate $1 of revenue. And <laughs> as a disruptor, it's, it's, it, it's actually quite exciting, to be honest. So as much as what COVID has been, uh, been a stressful time, it has also given us an opportunity of looking at really exciting initiatives that we're about to bring to market, and that should be within the next month or so. Um, for folks out there that would like to just follow us, they're more than welcome to go to our Facebook page. We have a very active Facebook um, um, page, that being Great Plains Conservation. We have also a very active foundation page that you know guests can follow the foundation's work on there, which is quite important because it's, it's works hand in glove. Um, obviously, we have the website greatplainsconservation.com. If they, you know, there is a mail and sign up that they can, you know, can fill in their details on and they can come onto our mailing list. Um, but also, what's also important is that we also have a lot of key safari operators and Africa specialists started around the world that we also work very, very close with. So, you know, if they, if they feel that they want to be able to talk to maybe somebody a little bit more local in the, in the you know, the countries of residence, they're more than welcome to do that as well. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of options that they can, you know, can follow us on Instagram in another one. Um, we've certainly seen that people are loving the photographs. We're quite lucky. We've got Beverly inside the company who happens <laughs> to share. In fact, today, we had an, um, a newsletter which is going out, which is specifically generated by Beverly using her aerial photography. So that's gone out. That'll be up on LinkedIn. It'll be on Twitter. So any one of the channels that, that folks want to reach out to us on, they're more than welcome to. And we'd love to hear from them. You know, even if it's just talking and wanting to know how they plan an itinerary or what did they think or how can they bring Cape Town into an itinerary or something like that, we're well positioned to help them on that. So, you know, and that stretches all the way up into East Africa. Great stuff. Um, I've been in conversation with Hilton Walker, who's from Great Plains Conservation. Hilton, as always, great to chat to you, and thank you for your time. It's a pleasure, anytime.